Hello everybody and welcome to the Keto Paleo Life. I am launching this new interview series with a very special guest today, Daryl Edwards, who's joining me from England. And I am really excited to have Daryl here and ask him a bunch of questions because um, as part of this new interview series, I really want to start digging into the lifestyle of what I call Keto Paleo which is much more than just your diet, much more than just your macros, but it is your whole life and your mindset as well. So we're going to have a more holistic perspective, a holistic view at all the different elements that it takes for you to really achieve a healthy and successful lifestyle for your happiness, for your life, for your quality of life, all the good stuff that you want. So welcome, Daryl, and thank you for joining me today. Uh, you're welcome. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak to you from, from across the pond, for sure. Right, right. Yeah, it's um, almost evening over there, right? And morning over yes, here. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Daryl, like, I would like to start our interview today like just talking a little bit about your story, because I think that is such a beautiful example of what we want to talk about. And um, how did you get to where you are right now as far as movement and your realizations about the importance of movement? Share, please, with us um, how you got here. Yeah, so I, I, I used to work, my former career was working within investment banking as a technologist. And so that job meant I was working pretty much seven days a week, 16 to 18 hours a day, sitting in front of a series of computer screens, or I'd be at home sitting in front of a series of computer screens, uh, working. And my responsibility was one whereby systems are working 24-7. So you have to be on hand, you have to be available to, to help out if there, are, if there are issues. And given that the bank was making a lot of money based on the systems that I was working on, the highly critical systems, making sure they were up and running and, and performing well. And... When I had an annual health check, I was told I was suffering from prediabetes, I was anemic, I had you know, really poor lipid profile, in, you know, elevated risk of cardiovascular disease, I was suffering from chronic low back pain, I had all, quite a few issues that, that you know, became apparent during this annual health check, you know, hypertension, um, and the solution offered to me by my doctor was to take medication. It's like, we'll give you some beta blockers for your blood pressure, take some statins for your cholesterol issues, take some pain relief for your back pain, your ongoing back pain, take some iron supplementation for your anemia. And uh, I was like, okay, this sounds great. You know, this, this sounds like a solution, but what about the side effects? How long do I need to be on these meds for? Side effects are plenty. And the in terms of time taken to, on these meds will be until the end of your days. So I was like, okay, whoa, that sounds, that sounds quite alarming. Is there anything else that I can do? And I wasn't really given many options by my doctor. So I had a, I do remember deciding, okay, you know what? One thing I had to do, I was aware that blood pressure and being physically inactive were linked. Um, I didn't believe it was just about my genetics, which is what my doctor said. Oh, there's not, not much you can do about it. It's just genetic. Um, I decided to join a gym and become phys more physically active. And within a very short space of time, my blood pressure started to normalize. Mm -hmm. and, um, and other health markers improved. So just becoming more physically active became a medicine for me. And so that became a gateway for me to think about, well, what else do I need to do? Because surely there are other things that I could be doing to support a healthy lifestyle. So then I looked at my diet. And I started initially, I did calorie restriction at first because I was like, I need to kind of get into, to change my body composition, get into shape. So I was like, yeah, maybe the best way of doing that is to lean out by reducing my calories. Um, and I just became very gaunt and didn't look too, didn't look too healthy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so then I went on a diet called the zone diet, which was back then, uh, you know, it's about sort of 15 years ago now was one of the low carb diets that were mentioned there's a south beach diet there's the zone diet there were a few of those i did the zone for a while 
but I was weighing and measuring my food and I felt as if I was very neurotic about it. Like I could only have nine almonds rather than 10. You know, I had to be counting in terms of blocks. Mm -hmm. So it was like, in my opinion, like a precursor to, to making sure you're working by percentages mm -hmm. um, of, of macros. Um, and then I had a book on my bookshelf, which I call a shelf help book called The Paleo Diet by Lauren Cordain. So it was a shelf help book because it was on my shelf and I bought it, put it on the shelf and didn't look at it for a couple of years. But then when I did actually get to look at it, I was like, oh my goodness, there's something here in this book which resonates with me. So I'm moving more, I'm becoming more physically active, I'm getting stronger, I'm getting healthier. Let me fuel myself to ensure that I can maintain that synergy between movements and improving my nutrition. And everything about that book was about going back to basics, mm -hmm. thinking about my ancestry, thinking about, um, you know, evolutionary biology. You know, it's the first time I started really to start to think about this approach. And that's taken me fast forward 15 years on. I quit my, my job in banking. I cross-trained as a nutritional therapist. I cross-trained as a personal trainer. I realized that I was most passionate about movement. I wrote a book called Paleo Fitness in 2013, five years ago now. I had a blog at the time um, called The Fitness Explorer, where I was just really talking about movement and, and paleo. And then I decided that I wanted to reach the masses when it came to encouraging people to move more. And I came up with something called Primal Play, mm -hmm. which is the, the primary focus there was getting people to experience the joy of movement that they had as children. So when movement was fun and engaging and invigorating, that's what I wanted to bring to an adult audience and to kids as well. Kids from four to 94 is how I how I like to kind of sell the proposition, sell this proposition. So that's that's really, uh, you know, my backstory in a, in a few minutes. Very, very sick, found out that lifestyle could be an intervention, movement was my gateway, that then made me consider nutrition, then started looking at my sleep, how I can improve my sleep quality, you know, how I can mitigate stress, because I was in a very stressful job. So all of these areas combined, multifactorial ways to improve my health, and I've maintained a really good health profile since then. I haven't had to go on any medication at all. Um, I haven't had to, I've been able to rely on movement and good food to pretty much support the foundation of, of better health. Fantastic, yes. That's um, a very inspiring story, I think. And especially for those of us who are in this world of nutrition and in this world of health, because I think that we, Daryl and I were having a conversation about this at some point. We met on the low carb cruise and we were able to, you know, discuss a lot of topics. But um, the importance that, of movement, how it's not really um, stressed in addressing lifestyle issues, addressing health mm. issues. So even myself as a nutritionist, you know, in the work with my practice and my patients, I focus on detoxing. I focus on changing their uh, dietary habits. I focus on, you know, giving them supplements. But how yeah. much is the focus on the movement part? I would say that until now, in my own practice, it was only about 5%, maybe 15%, 10%. Yeah. Um, I always stressed it, but not enough. And in my experience, Daryl is like... Um, I started to do Daryl's program last week, the beginning of this week. And just by doing the program and like really consistently moving every single day, I am starting to deeply understand the benefits and how just that can add a really important part to your picture of health. Yeah. So um, I wanted, and we'll talk a little bit more about your program at the end um, of the interview, but there are a couple of questions that I really want to ask you that I think um, my listeners would be very interested in. Um, we talk, I talk a lot about adrenal health, adrenal fatigue with them. And um, a lot of the women that come to me for help, they have major adrenal issues. Uh, so, uh, you know, as a nutritionist, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the scenario of like, 
your adrenals being constantly under stressors and then like getting fatigued not being able you know either cortisol is too high or cortisol is too low so um i would like to hear your opinion on exercise as a stressor or as a stress relief so this what kind of exercise it could be just a stressor what kind of exercise can be a stress relief what's your take on this how do we support the adrenals through exercise yeah so um so i would say there's a couple of things that i would say i, I would say acutely exercise is a stressor and it should be a stressor mm -hmm. it's it should it should uh, give the body physical stress overload for the body to become stronger and uh, what research tells us is that a series of acute stresses that come from exercise will reduce chronic stress, will improve immunomodulation, mm -hmm. will improve the HPA axis in terms of the ability to, to regulate cortisol and adrenaline correctly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So the immune system improves, the ability for us to, to regulate stress improves. And so if you just, because you're chronically stressed, if you decide, you know what? The best thing to do is for me to, me to remove as many stresses as possible. That's the best way to to get back to to, norm, to the norm. I would argue that's not the best way mm -hmm. to achieve kind of homeostasis mm -hmm. in managing stress. I would say you need to just dial dial things down and have the appropriate amount of stress that will actually lead you to better able to to modulate stress. So um, somebody with adrenal fatigue, somebody who is you know, constantly wired or completely flat and, and not able to, you know, has no energy or is constantly on the go, there are other things that they need to be considering. So for example, of course, food is a, is a great intervention, mm -hmm. but they need to be thinking about, you know, are they having, how many cups of coffee they're having in the morning, right? Um, how, late, how late are they going to bed at night? Are they studying, you know, uh, cortisol, uh, you know, elevated cortisol at one in the morning because they feel that understanding how it works is going to be, be more beneficial to them than actually going to, going to sleep? So, so from, a, from a research point of view, you know, I don't believe there's any single factor that needs to be um, added to promote a healthy lifestyle. You've got to take all those factors into account. You've got to look at your quality of sleep. You have to look at your quality of movement and how much movement you're doing. You have to think about the quality of your diet and the nutrient density of your, of your diet. You have to make sure that you have periods of very, very low stress. So maybe meditation might be an intervention for, you, for yourself. Mm -hmm. Maybe very slow, low-intensity movement like yoga and Pilates. But also by operating at very high intensity, Right? That's one of the ways. If you avoid stress, the body doesn't know how to build resilience. Right? So stress is, about, uh, is also about resilience. It's being able to deal with life's challenges, mm -hmm. whether they're the real, real challenges that we had to face as hunter-gatherers, you know, being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, or whether it's the modern-day perceived stress of worrying about you know, whether it's many problems of you know, what my boss is going to say to me tomorrow because I haven't completed my report. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I try to always go back to an evidence base which, which suggests that exercise of whatever persuasion reduces chronic stress. Okay, better able, it's better able to regulate cortisol, better able to regulate uh, the stress, stress hormones. So do you think that this is like kind of like bringing us back to a stress profile that is more... Um, is closer to the evolutionary stress profile, which would be that instead of like a constant chronic stress, like low burning chronic stressors, we like yes. try to eliminate the, the like low stressors and reduce them as much as possible. But then we introduce this like high burst of stress, like it would be running away from the tiger. But instead, this time we do like primal play or, you know, um, yes, I, I, another I think that's... form of exercise. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I totally agree. So I think sometimes we confuse the acute with chronic and we assume if something's chronic, then we've got to avoid even the acute. Because surely if we're already stressed out, then any stress at all is bad for us, yeah. right? Actually, no. I would argue that some stress, and again, you, you, there's a fine balancing act here. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't want too much stress yeah. you know, when you're already overly stressed. 
but you want some because you want your body to start recognizing what real stresses are. You want your body to be able to say, you know what, in this situation, I need to be able to get stronger. And that strength isn't just about muscle tissue. Mm-hmm. It's about it's about resilience. It's mm-hmm. about homeostasis. It's about your body recognizing what's real, what's perceived, mm-hmm. and how to better handle the the you know the fight or flight mode or the freeze mode. You know. So when do I need to do nothing mm-hmm. at all? Mm-hmm. So there are times where doing nothing is really beneficial. Mm-hmm. So if you're chronically stressed, you need to spend a significant amount of time doing nothing. If you're threatened by a rattlesnake, right? You may not be able to run. You may not be able to fight it. You may just need to stand still. So even when we're talking about stress, we're not holistic enough because we talk about fight or flight, but we don't mention the freeze response, which is also an evolutionary adaptation hmm. where we are aware that freezing is also really good for us at times, mm-hmm. right? So, so I would say by engaging in very acute, high-intensity activity for very, 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 very short bursts, Spending a lot of time in this freeze mode because at the moment anything could tip me over the edge. I need to spend some time getting some serious amount of de- uh, downtime. Mm-hmm. Digital te- detoxing, not just a, a you know a anti-inflammatory diet form of detoxing, but actually detoxing in, in so many areas. Yeah. Toxic relationships, you know, uh, d- social media detox, pollution, you know, whether it's noise pollution. Mm-hmm. outdoor pollution. I mean, there are so many areas that we need to consider. So movement is just one part of that. And movement, unfortunately, is underrated. And I've heard so many times people saying, oh, what can I do? I've, I've got chronic fatigue. I'm adrenally fatigued. I, I can't do any exercise. I used to do run marathons. And I used to be really, really fit. Now I can't even get out of bed. And you're telling me I need to exercise? Uh, yes, I am, actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am telling you to exercise. But it doesn't have to be running marathons. It doesn't have to be doing steady state chronic cardio mm-hmm. it's about it's about changing the the prescription mm-hmm. to suit what you're trying to deal with it's funny because i thought that i was going to really disagree with you during this interview but i think we're actually on the same page <laughs> well I, well it's, it's good to, it's good to hear and and you know I'm, I'm sure some of what i'm saying is will challenge some of the audience mm-hmm. who will assume If I am chronically stressed, the best thing for me to do is probably just lie in bed in a darkened room, listening to Enya and some chill out, you know, some chill out music, um, you know, saying some mantras from the other side of the world. Maybe, you know, maybe that's what people believe. But, you know, we weren't designed just to be cocooned in, a, in this really safe place, in this darkened room that we can avoid all stress because that life is better that way. That's not the reality. The reality is that we are facing or will face some stresses. We are going to face issues that we don't have control over. How can we better manage those? And so you've got to throw everything into the mix so, to, to ensure you're in a better place. Thank you. Yes. And so tell, let's go into some specifics here because this is really interesting. And like, how would you apply? Let's say one case scenario, because like people really like some practical tips and some, you know, real like applicable um, case scenarios that they can apply to their lives. So let's say that you're a woman and most of my audience are women. I mean, you're not a woman, evidently, but <laughs> you have a lot of women clients. I know. Yes. So. So if you're a woman and who does have extreme adrenal fatigue and you have reached a point mm. where like you're really exhausted all the time and um, lots of stressors all the time. So how would you restart and reset from that point? Like on a practical day to day routine, so how many days a week would you exercise for how long mm. and what kind of exercise would you do especially? So I would say initially you've got to consult You've got to consult the practitioner who can give you the right type of advice. So there's no one size fits all. Uh, it's a bit like a nutritional intervention. If you're healthy, then you could argue a generic, clean, uh, nourishing diet is the way to go. If you're dealing with a particular issue, then you may need to have some elimination. You may need to have something that's going to improve gut flora. You know, th- there are particular interventions that to target particular issues. I would say it's exactly the same for movement and exercise is medicine. Mm -hmm. It depends on the individual. I could not give you a generic prescription. Mm -hmm. What I would say though, because as you say, people want, they like tips, they like some instructions, is that for the individual who's completely 
feels completely tired, fatigued. I have no energy to get, get out of bed. I would say to satisfy the intellect, I would say that the mitochondria, which provides energy to the cell, the powerhouse of the cell, right? The best way, the only proven way to improve the volume mm -hmm. and, and, and to create mitochondria, the so mitochondrial genesis, is through movement, is through physical activity. So even a very short burst, if you get out of bed and your first thing you want to do is to grab yourself a cup of coffee, instead of making that cup of coffee, spend a few seconds doing some jumping jacks, you know, sprinting on the spot, getting yourself out of breath within seconds. doesn't have to be a long period of time. Just enough for you to get the blood rushing, just enough for you to get out of breath, just enough for you to realize that you're alive, right? That's what I'm talking about. So it doesn't have to be much. And just by doing that, just a few seconds in the morning, instead of preparing that coffee, which you know will elevate your cortisol, right? Will give you an adrenaline spike, artificially so, by drinking caffeine. Instead of doing that, do some movement for 10, 20 seconds. See how you feel, right? You will feel as if that's probably the, my, my first day in hell. You may feel that way after 20 seconds of doing so, but you'll start building up some resilience, You'll see how you feel the next day. You know what? Maybe I'm not quite right today. Mm -hmm. I'll take a day off. Mm -hmm. So maybe every other day mm -hmm. to begin with, mm -hmm. at 20 seconds. Um, and I was looking at some research the other day. I spent a lot of time looking at uh, cancer, uh, researching cancer, especially physical activity as an intervention. And one of the things that is advised to chemotherapy patients, so those who you could argue are also, I mean, pretty much all of their uh, systems are, broken right mm -hmm. after 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 chemo everything is everything is is flat uh they're fatigued they have no energy exercise pretty intensive exercise is used as a way to reduce fatigue mm -hmm. so you've got to, you've got to ask yourself the question why would somebody be given this intervention mm -hmm. why does research tell us that exercise is one of the best ways of reducing fatigue mm -hmm. and then say you know what you're fatigued don't do any exercise because your adrenals are, are a bit screwed up yeah. right so yeah so so that's what i would suggest start mm -hmm. off gently but intensely yeah see how you feel and then try to slowly increase your dose mm -hmm. and make sure you're having enough rest and recovery make sure you're having some significant downtime so you're not you don't get into like an overtraining mm -hmm. uh, state great so yeah i just want to say that i have a rebounder and sometimes like I wake up in the morning just feeling absolutely blah. And what I do is I do about 30 seconds of jumping jacks on my rebounder. It's one of those mm. little trampolines, you know. And even like in between my day, like because I sit a lot on this computer. And so when I feel like, oh, I have been sitting for three hours. So I just run outside and bounce for like a minute, like a crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> but just getting like, because I don't have time to do anything else. And yes. I mean, I could just do jumping jacks behind my chair, honestly, but the rebounder is like, I like it because it's easy on the knees and it's more fun, you know, yes. and sometimes you it's, right, it's right behind my chair in my office mm. when like mm. it's winter and it's cold. I put the rebounder right behind my chair. I get up from the chair, bounce for five minutes, for one minute, for 30 seconds, and then I go back to sitting. So I really yeah. like that idea of like that little short burst. And so we call that high intensity interval training kind of, right? That's kind of like a fancy name for that or. Um... Yeah. So if, if it's, I mean, if it's something, if it's something that you, you could do it for about 20 seconds and feel like I couldn't do a second longer, that would be high intensity. Um, and there's no, no intervals there because you're, you're only doing one what, interval. It once. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, but I mean, you could go one better, put on, you know what? Have your favorite music a, a, a mouse click away mm -hmm. and use that as your way to get yourself moving for a minute or so. Do you know what I mean? Dance like you were a teenager. Put your favorite song on that you used to play on repeat and use that as your way to motivate yourself to have some fun. Because even something like doing jumping jacks, I mean, for me, if I had to do a minute of jumping jacks, I mean, that, would, that minute would last an hour, feel like an hour to me, right? doesn't, you know, for yourself, it works, right? But it doesn't work for everyone. For me, that doesn't, that wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, especially when no one's around, 
I'll put on like my favorite Michael Jackson track that I used to listen to in the early 80s. I'll pretend I'm the best dancer in the world. I'll moonwalk, you know, it doesn't matter what it looks like, but I'll give it a try. And I have a smile on my face um, and I have lots of fun. So I think if you can infuse fun into, your, into, into movement, which is what I try to do with Primal Play, that's a great way to give you some motivation to do it. That sounds awesome. And um, yeah, I want to talk about the program in a second, but I have another question that um, it's really present for me and I'd love to hear your take on that one. And by the mm -hmm. way, you guys, I saw Daryl in action on the cruise on the dance floor. And yes, he can bust a mean move. <laughs> He's not joking. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I've, re I've retired. I've retired a long time ago. But every now and again, I come out of ret early retirement. <laughs> he was the life of the dance floor. So um, about metabolic rate, this is something that uh, is very present in my day-to-day -day practice. I get asked a lot of questions and I have to deal with this mm. with my patients. So when you get that case scenario where somebody comes with this extremely low metabolic rate and, mm. you know, because of yo-yo dieting all their lives and they've tried all the different diets, mostly low fat, high carb, mm -hmm. super calorie restricted. So it's just like the metabolic rate keeps getting lower and lower. And mm -hmm. at the same time, on the other side, in the endocrine scenario, they have these like super tired adrenals and kind mm -hmm. of general hormone dysregulation. So yes. how do you balance that? How do we resuscitate the metabolic rate? How do we get them to burn some calories for energy again, instead of being like frozen, like in a block of ice? Well, I mean, even with somebody with a, uh, you know, again, I mean, this is probably where we, we, we might slightly disagree, uh, you know, metabolic, metabolic rate, even if you have a low metabolic rate or lower than what it should be, mm -hmm. majority of your calorie burn, your calorie expenditure is maintaining that you expend every day, is, exp is literally maintaining you, your, your being alive. Right? So you're doing nothing, absolutely nothing all day. You're going to be burning uh, you know, two-thirds plus of the amount of calories you need just mm -hmm. is, is spent on you just breathing and mm -hmm. being alive. Mm -hmm. right? So even somebody who has a, a low metabolic rate, you're probably going to be down-regulated down by a few hundred calories at most, to be honest. Mm -hmm. it's, not that, it's not that significant. Mm -hmm. What makes the biggest difference mm -hmm. to your metabolic rate is the amount of fat mass that you have on board. Mm -hmm. So uh, fat tissue, adipose tissue, is less metabolically active than muscle tissue. So if you increase lean body mass, if you increase lean muscle mass, you'll burn more calories. So for example, um, uh, I think a pound, of, a pound of muscle will burn 9, 10 calories mm -hmm. you know, uh, per day. Uh, a pound of fat mass might burn about 5 or 6 Okay, so there's a difference, significant, quite a significant difference in the burn rate if you're storing more muscle than fat. So I can increase my, my metabolism just by increasing the amount of lean muscle mass that I have. And that, I would say, is the best way of doing so. It's a very simple, you know, a very simple equation. Mm -hmm. Do more exercise, build more lean muscle mass, you will reduce the amount of body fat that you're having to maintain, and then your metabolism will increase. Uh, there's interesting studies actually that those who are overweight or obese mm -hmm. can actually have a faster metabolism than somebody who's lean. Mm. Do you know why that is? Mm -mm. Not, not, many people know, not many people are aware of that. No. The reason being is because they tend to have, take into account their increased amount of, of body fat, they have more muscle mass in comparison to somebody who's a lot lighter than they are. Mm -hmm. So their total muscle mass is more, even though the percentage is, is less, mm -hmm. their total muscle mass is more. And muscle mass is, um, as I said, metabolically very demanding. Mm -hmm. So they can have a faster metabolism. Mm -hmm. you know, so in other words, somebody who's obese might need 2,500, 3,000 calories just to maintain themselves at, at rest. I may need only 2,000, mm -hmm. even though I have much less body fat than they do. Do you mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Yeah. So this... So some of this is a is kind of a it's it's a bit of a myth. It's an urban myth almost mm -hmm. about about met, uh, metabolic um, management of the metabolism. And 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 even though many of us can go into starvation mode, we can dial that down by as you say yo-yo dieting and a series of crash diets. 
that can occur, but it's very easy to, to get out of that just by exercising and building the muscle mass. So changing your diet alone, even if you're losing body fat, right, even if you're losing weight, may not add an increased percentage in lean body mass. Right. You, know, you, you know, you may be actually losing muscle tissue whilst you diet. You may be losing bone density as you diet. So we need to be aware that mm -hmm. it's important to track not just body weight, not just your metabolism, but your percentage of body fat and your percentage of lean uh, muscle mass. And yeah, that totally makes sense to me. And, you know, for me, it really comes into this bigger picture of like restoring your health before you even try to lose weight because you know i got a lot of patients that come to me wanting to lose weight and they just don't want to do the work or like they just want a quick solution a quick fix like they don't want to wait but this is not just about like you say restoring this metabolic rate but for me it's like getting healthy like you get into healthy weight when you get healthy and not by trying to force your body to like shed weight because you're so fixed on that number on the scale that means yes. something when in reality, like what is underneath the surface is exactly what you're talking about. You know, um, that's why they talk about skinny fat because some people like, you know, they're not overweight, but they also, they're very low in muscle mass. And so that leads yes. to like a number of other health implications. So yes, for sure. I, think... I used to be skinny fat myself, so yeah. so I, you know? I I looked I looked okay on the outside, but I wasn't okay on the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah, so just focusing on the weight, total body weight, isn't always a good idea. Um, and you know we know that the more um, the way I like to put it is it's kind of excess. You know, there's a there's a there's a frame that you have. Mm -hmm. And there's a point where an excess in body weight will be too demanding for what you need to be carrying in terms right. of body weight around with you. And it will have an impact on your metabolic health, i.e. you will have increased risk of metabolic syndrome, increased risk of cardiovascular disease. It, it will lead to, to being unhealthy. And the same goes the other way. If you, go, if you go past the point of kind of weight homeostasis whereby – you've lost too much weight, mm -hmm. then we know there are also implications. And those implications can mean, you know, for women missing their periods, you know, amenorrhea, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, there are, so, there are so many issues that can occur. Brittle bones, yes. you, know, um, you know, being orthorexic, you know, kind of constantly being neurotic about what you eat and, and don't eat and how you, you look in the mirror and aesthetics, a focus on aesthetics rather than health. So I think there's, there is a sweet spot Mm -hmm. And that sweet spot isn't saying I am X number of pounds or kilos. The sweet spot is what maintains really good health for you. And um, we need to be aware that health is not just one or two markers that our, our nearest lab can provide for us. Our body is extremely complicated. There are so many factors that lead to good health now and also good health and longevity for the future. So I try to rely on as, as many indicators as I can some very, very simple, and some that may be more complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, but day to day, I like to focus on the things I don't have to worry about so much, you know. Mm -hmm. So I focus on, I focus on things like my blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So I had a tendency to have hypertension. Those of African descent, which I, which I am, tend to have higher right. blood pressure right. uh, than those of European descent. So I, I track that. It's one of the biggest causes of, of death, of premature death. Mm -hmm. So I track that on a regular basis. I track my resting heart rate because resting heart rate is linked to longevity. The less my heart has to do from one minute to the next, it, showed, it proves that I'm healthy, a healthier individual than if my heart rate was another 10 beats per minute. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there are things that I can, I can track without going having really intrusive tests. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, so my, I don't know what my weight is. But I have an awareness of what my body fat percentage is, for example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because that gives me more that gives me more information. Beautiful, thank you. I think that's really important, and it's part also of like the mindset, you know, approach and like the changing the mindset towards our body, self image, health. This is like a whole other big conversation, and you know. Yes. I could be talking to you for hours on all these different topics. Thank you so much, Daryl. Like you are um, a really like 
super experienced and knowledgeable person and thank you so much for sharing that knowledge with us and with the listeners here i want to just like um share about your program and i can't show it on the computer but animal moves is the latest book is daryl's latest book and this has a program but he also has an online program with amazing videos and explanations and it's like all broken down 30 days um and i'm gonna be posting a link under the video and in the blog post so you guys will know how to find it i am doing the program now i'm in week one i think today's day four and um feeling benefits already unbelievable and i'm doing this with my yoga teacher and my friend who is very fit and it's not easy it's challenging it's hard it's super fun you guys i am on instagram and like on the nourish cayman on instagram i'll be posting stories almost every day with my progress and the silly stuff we do daryl i've seen some of that tell us a little more about the program daryl um what do you want to add to that yeah so i i basically wanted people to to give people a way to incorporate a, a, a more balanced movement diet. So most of us tend to, you know, it's a bit like, you know, if you love avocados and then decide, you know what, all I'm going to eat are avocados from now on. And as nutritious as they are, they don't give us everything that we need, right? Even liver, as nutritious, nutrient dense as liver. liver is, if we only had liver and that was it, mm. over time there will be <laughs> some deficiencies, nutrient deficiencies. I so I, I think, um, you know, it's the same with fitness. If you're only moving one way all of the time, you'll start building up some deficiencies in terms of what our body needs from movement and physical activity. So that means not just what you do, but the intensity that you work in, durations that, that involved, um, you know, the type of movement patterns that you engage in. And I wanted to use the animal kingdom as, as a reference. So humans are generalists of movement, not very good as specialists. So we can't run very fast, like a cheetah can outrun us very easily. You know, a camel can out sprint Usain Bolt, for example. You know, we can't jump very far. Ants are far stronger than we are in terms of their body weight. They can lift up to 100 times their body weight. Okay. We can lift two or three times and we celebrate that. And those are the strongest individuals on the planet who can do so. So, so you know, by mimicking the animal kingdom, by moving in the, way, in the ways that they move, we become more human. So we, be, we take on board more movement patterns. We start becoming more like our ancestors were, who would crawl to track animals, who would climb trees for better vantage points, who would sprint to run away from predators or sprint towards, mm -hmm. you know, for predation to be able to capture mm -hmm. uh, animals, you know. Uh, they would jump. They would lift and carry. So there were so many movement patterns that they would engage in. I wanted to package this in a book and say, train like an animal, to become more movement, uh, more human. Uh, move this way at varied intensities because then your movement diet will become richer and more nourishing. Nice. So to be a more nourished caveman or cavewoman, part of that incorporates movement and movement of different persuasions. So it's like a buffet, but you know, like a buffet or smorgasbord of, of movement, mm -hmm. but you have to take part in all of them. You have to take part in every single part of the buffet. You can't just go, you know what, I'm only going to have desserts. No, you have to have, to get the best experience, you have to have all of the components of, of movement and of fitness. So that's a pretty elaborate way of explaining what that book uh, and, the program. About, and, the, and the online program. So yeah, the book can only go so far because it's, it's obviously better for you to first to visualize what mm -hmm. the movement patterns should be looking like. Um, you know, there's a, there's a group, a uh, private group on Facebook of those who are taking part in the, in the challenge. You can communicate how they're getting on and that works, mm -hmm. that works really well. So as, as Vivica said, there's a, there'll be a link somewhere down there. Maybe to, I don't know which side it is. It's, I was going to cover all bases. It's there somewhere. Uh, click the link and you'll find out a lot more about the online challenge, the animal moves challenge. Well, thank you so much, Daryl. This was, um, I think, super informative and really helpful. And we might have to have another chat again sometime soon because I have three more questions that I was going to ask you, but we're running out of time. And uh, um, 
yeah, I'm going to keep everybody posted on how my progress goes. I am, I'm really excited about doing this program. And it's, like I say, it's been super fun. So where can people find your social media? Last last little thing. Where do they find you? Aside from yeah, so below here. Where... <laughs> below, below, below there. Um, if you want to find out a lot more about the about Primal Play and the philosophy, you can go to primalplay.com. So I do provide some, you know, some games and some exercise and activities, but I also provide a lot of evidence as well. Fitness, um, best fitness website of 2018 by Paleo Magazine. You should mention that. Yes, I should. Well, it's better when somebody else mentions it. Okay. So I'm glad, I'm glad you did. Um, so, yeah, because it sounds like I'm just pretending if I say it. So thank you for mentioning that. Uh, but, yeah, so if you want some research, if you want to find out a lot more about, about Primal Play and about movement as medicine, primalplay.com. If you search for Daryl Edwards, D-A-R-R-Y-L Edwards, Google has been wonderful to me. So you will notice that I'm number one on Google if you search for me, of course. Um, so it's very easy to find out what I do and where I'm at. And in terms of social media, at Fitness Explorer is my moniker. So you can find me on Twitter, on Instagram, on, you know, you can search me on Facebook. So um, I, I kind of spread myself probably a little bit too thinly sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I like to engage with people. Um, I like, I love hearing feedback. So if you have any questions, if you want to find out more about what I do and why I do it, please interact with me on on social media because I don't have any real friends. So like, any virtual ones who want to contact me, uh, kind of makes my day. Daryl is actually really available and is um, awesome in answering questions because I've been pestering him with questions about the courses since I started. So thank you so much, Daryl. It was an awesome interview and good luck with your course and all your future endeavors. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. You've been a fantastic host and I look forward to, to part two uh, in, the, in the near or distant future. All right. And thank you so much, you guys, for watching the Keto Paleo Lifestyle.